And on that policy, there is a no tolerance place that your staff is supposed to sign. Now, probably the new staff in orientation, Jill, has that started yet in orientation where we're getting them to sign that? Or no, it wasn't you. It was Katie actually was going to do that. Katie Ray? Okay, get the microphone so every is right behind you. Uh, Katie is going to talk about it in nursing services orientation for new hires, but the decision was made that the signature would take place in the department the so that they had it for the employee file. Okay, perfect. So that puts accountability on two people. One, the nurse directors clinical staff leads, it's your responsibility, you're accountable to get this signed. Educate your staff. There is not a leeway with this. It's starting now in orientation as we go forward. So it needs to be signed. The no tolerance means that it could lead up to termination. This is a patient safety issue and it will not be tolerated. No one can bypass the system. Remind every nurse that it is this barcoding is not to make you faster to get meds, it's to make it safer. So we have to follow the policy. And I'm pretty lenient. I think you know on some things I think I can, I'm and good to negotiate things with you as you feel necessary and you feel like that are appropriate. But when it comes to patient safety and medications, I'm not going to be lenient. It's no tolerance. So that's why we put that in there. So just so I have everybody's undivided attention on that and know we have had a couple of instances, but going forward this policy will be enforced. So can't come back and say well they didn't know unless they didn't know and then I, then it would be on on your watch, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, now I'd like to introduce uh, Mrs. Alice Bell. She is an advanced practice provider and let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a senior director for the advisory board and you know we have that um, I want to say agreement or partnership with the advisory board, our nurse executive center where we get uh, some uh, we get the daily briefings, we get a lot of uh, information from the advisory board and one of the things that we did get with this that I really enjoy every year is an on-site um, visit, visit, visitation or, or on-site consultation and that's what this is today and when I look through all the different topics um, I thought oh my goodness what would we choose because we would benefit from hearing any of these uh, or participating in a workshop with any of these things but one thing that I really liked and I attended this in person last year was uh, the nurse manager overload and you have a packet with all the materials in there and Sharon said to remind you you've got a sign-in sheet there then you return your sign-in sheet to Sharon so you'll get credit for that we'll work out the CEUs and all that later but anyway um, I veered off from introducing our speaker but I just wanted to say this is why that we ha are fortunate enough to have Alice Thornton Bell with us today you have her bio in your uh, packet so I don't want to just read forth everything but one thing that uh, I do like to see when someone comes to speak is that it's not someone that whether it's advisory board or SG2 or another think tank if you will where they just pull different speakers that may not know the topic. If you look through here you'll see that there's over 40 years of progressive experience in clinical practice and education, um, administration in rural health and I noticed we have Renee Grayson here she's sitting in the front uh, with our health center so I'm sorry I didn't mention that when we we're doing our roll call but Renee is here with us so glad you're here too Renee. But anyway um, she, so she has a varied degree in nursing in which all of you as you're growing in, in your uh, careers, you're beginning to get all that experience too. So this is not someone that is just coming to talk about something they read out of a book, but has actually lived, breathed, and worked this on everyday uh, living with what she does. So uh, she has a master's degree in nursing from Wichita State University and several other degrees also. But Without further ado, I'm not going to continue to read the bio because you have that in your packet, but I am so excited that she's here. And if, if I could ask you um, what you think 
would be one of the hardest things in your role uh, today as nurse manager our nurse directors and remember we oh, use the title that. clinical staff leads and uh, Alice is very she knows about that that we don't use the title nurse manager we use clinical staff lead but we're referring to that and we use nurse director but what is the hardest from my perspective because I have a lot of experience like her and I can tell you being around and I've told you this many times the hardest position, when I say hardest position, it is so hard and difficult and challenging, is that middle person, that nurse manager, that nurse director, or clinical staff lead. That is the hardest position, I think, in the healthcare organization. Because you have the push from on top to do this, do this, do this. You have the push from on bottom, don't do this, we don't want to do this. So what do you do? What's the best thing to do? How do we balance this and keep our life? How do we have a life and uh, how do we balance this role? So I hope you'll glean some things from this today. Please be interactive. I'm sure that she will want to, to uh, have questions and interaction with you all. And feel that n there is not a question or not a comment that is, is not right. Probably someone else is thinking about it. So please uh, do that. So without further ado, I'll let you come forward. Jan, Let's thank give you. Give her a welcome. Ah. That's Southern hospitality, right? <laughs> Have I got the volume okay, gentlemen? Good. They gave me a thumbs up. Thumbs up. So I'm going to push that away and do this and say good morning. Um, I'm so glad to be here and for several reasons. When we were talking beforehand. You guys, I had to scrape a quarter of an inch of ice before I drove to the airport yesterday. Um, and so, you know, to be in the 70s today is just absolutely fabulous. But I've only been to Chattanooga a couple of times. And so I'm especially pleased. And as Jan said, I hope we can be very interactive as we go through this morning. And the same goes to... Um, all of our sites that we have out there. You guys, is it difficult for you to switch between our slides and seeing them like you did a minute ago? Okay. So when we get to some discussion points, I may ask you to let us see them. Oh, good morning, everyone. You know, when we think about communication, how much of our communication is nonverbal? Anybody know? at least 70%, some people say up to 90%. And so I love it when I can see folks that are out, and out at the other locations when you guys speak too, so I appreciate that. Um, it, where'd Jan go? If, if you'll indulge me for a minute as a CNO who also went through um, barcode medication administration, I, I, I want to share a story with you all because one of the things we know, how many of you are in those clinical staff leader positions? And so you're directly teaching staff about this. We know that when people truly understand why they're doing something, not just because my manager said or the hospital thinks we need to have this, but why from that perspective of that patient in the bed or the clinic or, or whatever, we get better compliance. If, if you think about the causes of death in the United States today, what are the leading three causes of death? You know? Patient errors is the third. It's cancer, heart disease, and patient errors. Actually, medical errors is the way it's stated. And within medical errors, the two biggest categories are medication administration and patient transitions as we don't get information passed from one place to another. I was working with a hospital around this whole issue of, of accountability and people following through on how, how systems are designed. And we had a nurse who really wanted to enhance her efficiencies, right? And so she had taken all of the stickers for all the meds to be given that day and put them on a, sh a sheet of paper and then scanned it. You smile. What's wrong with that? It's much faster, right? Why is that a problem? How do you know it's the right patient? How did you take the safety out of it? If, if medical errors are the third leading cause of death 
in the US and we do not have the best quality in the world. And medication errors are a big piece of that. When, when we make it easier for our work, we've totally ignored the patient and family of what we need to be doing from a safety perspective for them. So feel free to use that story <laughs> as an example as you, as you work with, with, your, with your staff. And hopefully as, as you get going with that, you'll get reports back too on um, just where you are in terms of accuracies and things getting administered the way they need to be. So uh, thank you for indulging me with that uh, sideline, I guess. Patient safety is something I'm pretty passionate about. You all should all have a packet, and special thanks to Sharon for getting that all put together. You, the sign-in sheet, when you sign in, please make sure you put your work email on there. Our systems recognize the domain names, and so with your work email, when Sharon sends that back to us, we will email your continuing education certificate directly to you. So do the sign-in. You've got a uh, big handout that will be all the slides that I'm going to cover. And you've also got an evaluation form. And please make sure that you fill that in at the end and, and turn it in. And we look you know, very seriously at those. The way we figure out even what to study comes from our membership on a survey we do on an annual basis and all the information that comes back on those evaluations. So very important to us. Oh, talking about nurse manager overload. And by that, I don't get hung up on the title, nurse manager. It's about any of us that are in leadership or management type roles. And I think we could probably take even nurse out of that. And it's probably many of our colleagues that feel it as well. But I don't know. You feel any overload? As people here chuckle, I'm guessing maybe we've got some chuckles on the other end of the line. What, what, what is it that's causing that? What do you think? Jan identified, and I agree with her totally, that you know that first line leadership role in an organization is absolutely one of the toughest. And I'm going to show you some data later in terms of how incredibly important it is. But what's making it so hard today? Nursing shortage. So you spend time on schedules and making sure you got enough people. Who said that? Where'd that come from? OK, back there. I'm sorry? Oh, age caps. Ah, we're being held accountable, aren't we? And people are saying patient satisfaction makes a difference. OK. What else? The acuity of the patient. Acuity of patient? You think it's worse? I'm sorry, what? That it's worse than when I first started, and that's already been not that long. So she says it's not been that long, and it's worse than when she started. And I would tell you that I started out as a critical care nurse well over 40 years ago, and those patients I was taking care of are now on your med surge units. And the patients that are in those ICUs, and when I'm home for a block of time, I do still do my clinical specialties in palliative care and hospice. And I do both hospital consults as well as in-home visits to do goals of care meetings and whatnot. Those patients in those ICUs today probably wouldn't have been alive when, like Jan and I, first got out of practice. And boy, the condition we send people home in terms of where they need to be with home health. So acuity, staffing. your department. I think the constant turnover creates your department to where I feel like in ours 80 plus percent are baby nurses. <laughs> oh, we're going to open a, the a whole box of things. So with turnover, have you seen turnover go up? Oh, yeah. Do you think that's related to age ranges at all? I and mean, we can go into a little bit of that, but we've got turnover from our younger generation because they have a desire to experience a lot of different things. And have you all hit the retirements yet? Is that beginning to hit? I was talking with a CNO oh, a couple weeks ago. And she shared with me that 60% of her nurse manager rank was retiring in the next year. 60%. 
So we're just going to take one whole half of this room out. And then she said, and I'm only about six months behind that. <laughs> Think about what happens with that. We're going to talk about all kinds of things that, that when we talk about this, this nurse manager overload. I, the advisory board now has oh, 4,400 hospitals and health systems that we partner with in 40 countries around the world. This actually surfaced on the international side as a key topic a year ahead of surfacing on the U.S. side. In many of our other English-speaking countries, uh, we talk about the NUMS. Well, the NUMS are just up, uh, the nurse unit manager. That's what that stands for. So it's, it's a topic that we've dealt with a, a, a fair bit. And I do hope as we get into all of this that people will feel free to to make comments, we've got William and Jocelyn back here with mics. And those of you at the remote sites, just I'll, I'll try to be good about pausing, but just jump in. We'll, we'll deal with that as we go. This is, this is what we're going to talk about. First of all, are you having an easy time filling open leadership positions? Jan's kind of shaking her head yes. Have you had an internal pipeline? We are fortunate in that we have had an internal pipeline, but uh, I think it's getting a little bit harder now because I've noticed that several um, jobs have been offered to people and they say, no, nah, I really don't want to do that. I just want to do my work and go home. So I'm seeing more of that as time goes on. What do your millennials talk about as wanting for their future? Work-life balance. If they're going back to school, it's for what kind of a role? Clinical advanced practice. And I have to wonder if that's because that's just the only thing they've really, they see that the leadership roles are so tough, or the only thing they've really heard about is the advanced practice, because that's where many of their faculty have come from. And we need to be talking more about uh, the leadership piece. I was in a leadership role many, many years before I went back to school for advanced practice. I always felt it, when I was a part of making a good decision, I was affecting more lives than just one-on-one -on -one care. And I don't know how much we're talking about the new folks. So we'll talk a little bit about what's happening with this job of nurse managers. The bulk of our program will be around some best practices that we've discovered in other organizations. They may not be exactly what you're thinking of. Maybe it's, maybe it's like, I can, I can use this. Or maybe it triggers a thought in your mind. And then we'll wrap up with a, a quick coda as we get into that. As we think about these nurse manager roles. Hmm. I bring work home every night. My kid says, I don't even know why you come home. Might as well just stay at work. Boy, I didn't realize the stress level or how much family time I missed. What's been the biggest surprise for some of y'all as you've, anybody in here in their role a year or less? Several of you. What's been the biggest surprise as you've moved into this role? Here comes the mic. More time at work and less time at home. So more time at work, less time at home. We didn't do a good job probably preparing. It wasn't my expectation. Wasn't your expectation. Okay. How about you guys in the back that raised hands? I think it's the same. More time here and less time at home. Is the job taking more time? What about any of you out in our broadcasting sites? I used to be a nurse manager and manage the ER, and now I'm on the stroke floor. And it is so much harder on the floor, I find, than it was in the ED. What do you think makes that harder? Uh, keeping staff. You know, everybody that... I now have as nurses that are young millennials, they want to go to the ER, they want to go to the unit, whereas 
They don't want to stay on a stroke floor. They don't want to stay on a cardiac floor. They, they just want to adventure out. So that's probably been my hardest thing is keeping, after they get their one year in and med surge, they're gone. Okay. Which, and I think Jan and I talked about this when we were talking about what program to do. One of the pieces that came out at the same time as, as this on nurse manager overload is it's titled Win Millennial Loyalty. But it's really looking at generations and what their expectations are in work. And based on that, what are some strategies that we can think about as organizations? And it's at least better to keep them within the big organization, if, even if they're not just going to be on your unit. And so how do we develop systems to support that? We've got 98% working over 40 hours a week and well over 80. <laughs> Last weekend, um, I have two of those millennials, so I understand. Some of it, I understand. Some of it, they don't fit. But I was clearing out some boxes and whatnot and came across some, you know, things I'd saved to my daughter. She turns 25 next month. One of those was something that, like, the kindergarten or first grade teacher had done where every special event, they had something in there, and there was a page that she'd filled out about what I like for my mom to do with me, for my dad to do with me. What does your mom like to do? You know what she had written in there? work which is true I've always loved what I, I I've always loved my work but it just it kind of hit me hard when I saw that my five-year-old at, at, at age five had identified that um, and it's I think getting worse now I almost think in fact I'm going to do it I almost think I need to flip the order of these two slides one of the things that we've learned the key to staff engagement lies with those of you in this room and the preceptors that you use. The reason I say that is when we have better staff engagement, we have better clinical outcomes, we have better patient satisfaction, and those organizations that have a high level of staff engagement also have the lowest cost to deliver care with those good outcomes. Part of why when we think about what is it we're all about, it's, it's not just med administration, it's patient safety. You know, it's taking it up to that big piece. You've got some examples here, you know, pressure ulcers, patient complaints, your overall hospital rating, which kind of looks to me like you guys do pretty good, right? But that challenge continues to be there. We know that this is the group that makes a difference in all of that. When you've got engagement, your absenteeism usually is less. Your turnover may be less. And there are a lot of different ways of measuring that. I certainly understand the frustration of being on a stroke unit. Do you keep them at least in the system, or do they say, I need to go experience something else? Does that make sense to you guys? It's one of those ahas that um, absolutely is, if staff are truly engaged, they care. And they want to go that extra mile for you, for the patients they're serving, the community that they're serving. We're very concerned, and this is really internationally, when we look at what's happening to leadership in, in nursing and a lot of our clinical services. You know, you've got a quote down there from a CNO who says, you know, I could go away tomorrow on the health system and survive. But if, if, if my nurse managers leave, there's an immediate negative impact, and it hampers our ability to function day to day. You guys are absolutely the linchpins of keeping organizations functioning. Nationally, we've got a vacancy rate of just over 8% in nurse manager roles. The big problem is the number of people we have that are planning on leaving. You, you're looking at, out of this sample, you know, 60% that are saying, I'm going to be leaving within the next five years. And we ask the question then as to why, because we know we've got an aging workforce. A, a percentage of those are retirements, so it's time to maybe slow down a little bit, not keep up this full pace. But we've got a large percentage saying, I'm leaving these roles for other reasons. I don't have time with family. 
or you know the the expectations the all the 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 things that come from absolutely all over the place our question becomes then how do we make sure if if this group is truly what can make so much difference in the outcomes our organization achieves if we don't have the right people in those positions what's going to happen to those outcomes so how do we how do we keep all that together this is where that, that phrase of maybe the job that nobody wants comes from. This is a pseudonymed organization, but they got to the point they were only able to fill about 15% of their manager vacancies from internal sources. Part of what happened to that then was a decrease in their nurse manager engagement. Now, if you guys aren't engaged, can we expect your staff to be engaged? That old phrase that, you know, leadership sets the tone. I have the chance to go in and out of three and four hospitals sometimes and health systems in a, a week's time. And you feel it when you walk in. Um, and it doesn't take long to pick up on that. As we start seeing a shift in this group's engagement, if you're feeling really overloaded, you're, you're going to get to the point you don't feel real engaged. If you lose interest in those management and leadership roles, then it ends up impacting all those outcomes that we have. A couple of possible trajectories. One might be that you just get burned out and leave. I'm, <laughs> I'm going back and take care of patients. I don't want to deal with all this other stuff anymore. Well, we can do some backfill, but it creates pressure on people that are in those roles maybe even worse is that side that says we burn out and we stay and you know you may be able to even think about folks with that it, it really impacts that overall work environment and I think it amplifies our, our risk of not keeping some of the good staff that we're able to attract I want to pause for a minute and reactions what do you think you feel this way? And I'll tell you from, my, from, from teaching this material now, I mean, almost well over a year, this is a really good time for there to be a lot of interaction because people that are in those more senior roles can't do anything about things that they don't know about them. So you feel the overload from staffing, from turnover. What else? Yeah. It's, Mike's coming. <laughs> I think for me and what I hear, um, I mean, me on a personal note, um, it's just the competing priorities. Okay. I feel like you never really get resolution with one thing before the next big thing is pushing on that. And I think just the rapid um, pace in which change has okay. to happen I, I, I find that it's just chaotic, um, and I think staff either get frustrated, it impacts what they think they're able to do at the bedside effectively, um, and so it's just a, it's compounding, I think, okay. for a lot of people. So the competing priorities. Anybody else? I agree with her. Part of, I think part of the other problem is I know that we have to do the change, but we continue to open units with no staffing. So our float pool goes there, so we have nothing to pull from when we're short or people call in. Okay. So back to the whole how, how we plan, the staff we have available and, and where we go. Anybody else? I think one of the big issues is that the staff see everyone in this room as being 24-7, but they also don't respect their time. So they will call on the weekends about something that can wait when we are happy to help them, but it starts to take a toll on our family lives and our, you know, whoever reports up to us. Has this thing made, and I'm holding up a cell phone, has this made a difference in our lives? Oh my gosh. 
even at least when we first had email, we had to go to our offices and on a desktop pull it up. Now, 24-7, 365, the information is out there. And they also think we are the ones that need to come and be, you know, when you have three call-ins, they think you need to be the one that comes in, and they don't realize that there are 60 of them and one of you. Okay, so the pressure to respond. How about some of our um, online sites? Anything to add? East, are you guys feeling the same thing? And we've got your pictures up here. <laughs> Remember to unmute your mic before you talk. Anybody, anything to add? Okay. I can't hear. Just a second. It's Martha. So where's Mar where's Martha? Martha, go up to the mic. I think all the managers here agree with all the calls on the weekends and expectations that they would be able to come in at all hours of night. Mm -hmm. Okay. What were you saying about the orientation for managers that they're just sort of put in positions without? Uh, any kind of training, management training. But leadership and management training, let alone, oh my goodness, if you get involved in a construction job. I thought, I went to nursing school, not to engineering school, or learned all of the rules and regs. Some of you are chuckling, like maybe you've been down that path as well. Yeah. Well, the good news is a lot of the things that you brought up are things that came up as we did our, our study in terms of at least what some folks have done about it. We'll, we'll spend some time to walk through some of those, those practices. You know, this role of, of nursing leadership, however you title it. Um, back in the day where when some of us first moved into that, we were still trying to convince people that we needed to be at the executive table. Advisory Board looked at this in, and published a study in 2006. So that's only, what, 12 years ago? And at that time, the problem was really about role perception. The, the rest of the organization didn't know we were out there and what a contribution really could be made by involving us in activities. By the time we got to 2016, oh my goodness, they've discovered you all. They've discovered you all and what an amazing difference it can make when they have you on a committee, a planning group, whatever the project might be. But it's led to all those things listed there in terms of the hours of work. And when I spend all of that with other groups, where is it for mine? And you know, so we've shifted from a perception of problem to the fact now people don't think they can do anything without you. Do you ever find multiple ones of you at the same meeting? And we, maybe we ask the question, do we all have to be there? Oh my, if we aren't there, that means I have to trust my colleagues or we have to learn more about one another's areas. But it comes those questions of, you know, what do we do with that? In 2006, we were really all about, let's cultivate this ambition and make sure people know who these folks are and, and what all they're capable of. And now we're talking about, oh my goodness, they're so overloaded. What can we do to streamline when we streamline work? If you go to the literature and, and look at what is it that really makes a successful uh, nursing leader, has a staff that's highly engaged. You know, these are the six elements that consistently bubble to the top. The fact that you're able to articulate a clear vision for those that you're working with, that you're good at developing those interprofessional relationships. I think one of the other things I've seen as people talk about uh, an older patient, a higher acuity patient, these are not patients that just need doctors and nurses anymore. 
my goodness, the physical therapist, the speech therapist, the dietitian, the pharmacist, the, the list goes on. So how good are we at working and developing those teams? Do we know how to set a goal and consistently work towards that? And even when we do that, how do we manage all of the conflicting priorities that come into the organization? The old supervisor was somebody who knew all the answers. I used to love working as a house soup on the weekends. You found out all kinds of stuff that was going on. And you solved problems, right? And there's a piece of me that's still kind of an old adrenaline junkie. So, you know, that was good. Well, today it's not about answering all those problems. It's about knowing what questions to ask your staff so they can solve their own issues. So how effective a coach are you? Can you have those difficult conversations when maybe somebody isn't following what practice needs to be? Being in touch with patients and staff. Consistently, this is what's talked about that makes that real standout nurse manager. We've kind of titled that slide, do you have the time to do those activities? Or do we get so busy doing what is our work or being sure that the units covered that we can't even get to that. So this becomes our analogy for the practices that we're going to talk about today. And you know, it's the sink that's absolutely overflowing. The drain is clogged, the faucet's on full force, and I don't have that picture there to say go get a mop and clean it up. The, the question is, what can we do so it will flow more smoothly? When we, when we think about this, and, and I had a, an instructor that, that works in organizations teaching lean methodologies, and she said to me, you know, we use a picture like this, but our comment is sometimes we get so busy mopping the floor, we forget to turn the faucet off. And I liked that reaction in terms of what, what's happening. What do we do with all the things that are coming in and then are meeting that clogged drain? And you made the mention already of all these priorities, but I can't get one finished or through the drain before I have to move to the next one. A lot of times those requests are not necessarily coming through Jan and her ACNOs. How often does a physician ask you for something in your area? or another department that wants to do something special for your area. They're, they're, they're requests that come at us from all over. So we talk about unclogging the drain. We also talk about reducing the flow or turning the faucet off. What can we do so that maybe there's a, a better way to streamline all of those projects that are coming at us? That picture resonate? What do you think? You're sitting there smiling. Comment? No? Anybody else? Did Jan pick the right topic? Oh yeah, okay. What's worse, unclogging the drain or stopping the flow? Think about that as we, as we move forward and, you know, maybe one is worse than the other. Maybe it's a matter of what's happening there with both of them. Think about what you've got in place. When we think about unclogging the drain, well, bigger picture, when we think about what do we do to stop overload, basically, you know, there, there are three paths to that. Unclogging, reducing, and then helping people help themselves, the kinds of things that you do in learning your own boundaries and time management. The, that's not going to be our issue today. We're going to be talking about the big picture systemic kinds of things. What's coming at you that there's so many things you can't get it out the drain, you can't get it finished and done and moved to the next, and then where are all those different things coming from? You know, that little gadget we have there that gives you messages 24-7 and I don't know. Do you have to answer it? How do you feel about that? 
Is it organizational culture that there's an expectation to, if your phone rings or you get a text that you respond? What do you guys think? Why'd you get so quiet on me? What I've realized is that if it's not life-threatening, I don't answer it. It'll wait till Monday. How has your staff responded to that? In the beginning, they didn't like it, but they realized that um, I have a life. I, I know some of them say, sorry to bother you. I know you're off, but could you check this for me? And I'll respond to them on Monday. Did you talk about that before you? Yes, I did talk about it in a staff meeting to say, you know, if you need me, I'm here. But if it's something that can wait till Monday, that I won't answer because I have a family. How about some of the rest of you? Yeah, down here. Thanks, Jocelyn. Well, me for one, I feel responsible. If somebody's going to be calling me, they wouldn't be calling unless they had a need. So maybe it's the way I was raised or work ethic or whatever, but I feel responsible to answer that call when it comes in. Okay. What else? You know, oftentimes when we start this program, one of the things somebody says is, is we can become our own worst enemies. It's one thing to be responsible and available, and it's another to let us zap, to let uh, that system zap all the extra energy that we have. And I think that's where we're going to go in talking about practices in what are then some of the kinds of systems that you do put in place. And you know from, from basic ideas of transitions and changes, you know, if you're going to do something different, you let people know about it ahead of time and have some conversation about it. What's going to work, what won't work, and, and, and we evaluate. These are the practices that we've collected under those headings of unclogging the drain and reducing the flow. Some of them may ring really true for some of you, and some of it, it may, may remind you of something else in the organization to begin to think about. But when we talk about unclogging the drain, do you ever get things piled up for you that you sort of feel like, well, somebody else, it, would have, it should have been okay if my staff just called and asked for this. I shouldn't have to get in the middle of it or involved. What, what do we do to really recognize, um, boy, you guys are worth your, worth your weight in gold when it comes to what you do to keep the organization humming. Those of us that are a little bit older are kind of saying, you know, who's, who's going to be making decisions about the care I receive a few years from now? Or my 88-year-old mother who's doing, doing great, but boy, she's got years to come. What do we do to protect that? How do we work with other in-house support? That's, that's that whole idea of trying to unclog the drain. When we think about reducing our flow and all of the initiatives that come to us, what are some things that some organizations have done to do a better job of identifying that time, where it's going, what we do about it? So filtering those initiatives that are coming from above, the lateral kinds of things that happen, and then we'll conclude talking about a couple of practices that organizations have done to deal with that 24-7 demand that I think people are feeling in the roles and, and folks that you have. Comments at this point? And our outlying areas, I'm just checking in. Jan, anything from your perspective? No, I think that you're just seeing a lot of reflective silence here because uh, I think they're all seeing, yes, exactly. You're right on target with what you're saying there. So. I think they're reflecting and uh, thinking about this. Thank you. And sometimes, with, especially with small groups, we start 
this whole program with a time of reflection, just asking you the question, why do you do what you do? And think about how, how swamped and pushed people feel and torn from families, and why do you do what you do? And so what are the things we got to do to make it better? So let's start through with some of the practices, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through a little bit of this, and then we'll take a chance to take a break. What are some of the things out there that we can do? First of all, when we think about elevating uh, the way this manager's role to sign off, you know, this is sort of saying you don't have to be the doer be for everything that happens, but it becomes about teaching others so that you aren't collecting everything, but you are the sign off. And a couple of things that we'll talk about here. How much do you have to hunt around for data, for reports and information that other people want? And then this whole idea of what happenings, happens with scheduling. A couple of big points that really bog folks down. Do you have to go out, do a lot of auditing, or collate those audits, or go to the computer to pull the financials and the productivity and the quality? And, or does somebody hand you a report that's been all put together and it highlights these are the areas you need to look at? Where are you on that spectrum? And I'm seeing some smiles that's kind of making me think you go out and dig up data. Do you? What's the, what's the biggest challenge? Finance, quality. Oh my gosh, she says before she gets the mic. <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest challenges is you have about 32 different programs to pull data from and then you have to go through 42 different people to get access and then it's not right the first time and then by the time you get a hold of somebody you have to call someone else or it's really difficult to figure out who to talk to about how to get what you need. Okay. Um, Epic has helped with some of the like the bedside data um, when it when you can get it to work properly we're still in the beginning stages it's not how long have you been on Epic? Since the end of October. So it's oh, still okay. very, very new. It's still very new. But it has helped. But right. that's one of the biggest things is knowing where to get the information. We're at that point that can you imagine going back to an all paper system? I mean, I can't with what I can access electronically. But the electronic systems are not completely working for us just yet. Any, how much time a month do you spend going out and calling people and figuring out who's got the information you need and putting it together and forwarding it to a, somebody else and getting it back because it doesn't address all the things they wanted. <coughs> got some heads shaking. Well, let's talk about this first practice here, which is, it comes to us from Yale, but they put in place a data expert, if you will. Now, this is a sample. Um, when you think about what maybe a, a nurse manager has gone out and had to figure out, well, how am I doing a, are you doing variance reports like on a regular basis? Some yeses, noes, are you digging into to all of that? So the question is how complete is the information when it comes to you to begin with? Yale identified that, my goodness, they had to go out and pull this from a bunch of different places and then one report didn't agree with another and what are we going to do with this? They hired a person in finance that was dedicated to nursing and I've had the pleasure of, of working with Yale on several projects and have heard firsthand from folks what a difference this has made. Basically, that data expert started by figuring out what are the reports that everybody needs to do on a regular basis and how do we get to that information in one or two clicks not 30 different places if you will their data experts began by putting together reports and then got to the point that they were able to see well where is the problem area wow we're over in salaries look at this overtime it is X percentage when we've only budgeted, you know, significantly less than that, and then saying we got to start asking the questions why. So it helps guide people into drilling to their root causes. One of the points that, you know, Yale senior leaders make is paying this kind of data expert 
it's a whole lot cheaper than paying a nurse manager to go out and pull of all of this. The position ends up, you know, it comes out of the, the bottom line overall, but it's funded through finance and they've got one person per, per service line. Now this is what a, a snapshot of what they've set up as their portal, if you will. This is my first click. I can just get to this finance portal. And you see a list of the kinds of reports that they can access through that. Uh, the filters that are there, they've tied finance, productivity. We're going to look in a minute at something that also ties their quality data. This is an example of um, a dashboard that will come out. You see the units and you see their NDNQI. What's their budgeted ratio versus then they'll look at what their actuals are. Look there, for example, at unit number eight you got a vacancy rate of almost 34%, so I would expect with that kind of a vacancy rate, they may be struggling more with quality outcomes, have higher overtime, et cetera. You see their pay periods, a staff engagement score. One of the things I love is that last portion where they've, they're correlating their finance and productivity data with their quality data. Are, Jan, I don't remember, are, you aren't using many travelers, right? Okay, so even if you've got float staff or people that are not used to being on areas, does it, do you think it impacts your quality or is there enough that standardized with a lot of things to the organization it may not? It impacts. So begin to think about how does all it, of it tie together? Now, this report comes to the managers put together like this so that it's your job then to help dig into the where do we have areas I really need to investigate that are out of line. What's your reaction to that? I've heard a couple wows. You, do you feel the difference in me collecting all this data and putting it together? versus really being the one that's analyzing the why of that. I mean, and I think that's what we found with, with the practice, so that it, it, it's, it's elevating. It's the difference when we talk about delegation. We can take vital signs. Nurse assistants can to take vital signs. The way we assess and think through the results of those vital signs is different because of our education and background. This is getting somebody else to take those vital signs and give them to you to be able to make the decisions from that. Part of what happens at Yale, the, the payroll trend report flags an area as an example that's over. You know, maybe the manager had been really frustrated because they've been running over and didn't really know why. Well, those data managers know how to get into what all's in that finance system and, you know, they can follow up when you start looking as an example at overtime. Typically, it's not the person who comes in and covers a whole shift for you that's problematic. It's all the little incremental over time that it's taken to get things done. This was a unit that saw um, a 12% decrease in what they were running with over time. Reactions, comments, is there, have, do any of you get to work with any kind of a data expert? You're kind of saying yes, so where, who's your... <laughs> we want everybody here. With finances, we work with Donna Taylor and she's amazing. So okay. she can help drill down on all of our financial stuff. So that makes So she can really help difference. you where to find things yes. at least. Okay. Yes. And to identify what the problems are as far as why we're over budget here or there. So okay. we do have that. I'm just going to add for clarity uh, to what Dana's saying, but at one time Donna Taylor did all of nursing, but mm -hmm. now she's specifically with the cardiac group. So we're hiring a process of interview another analyst that will take Donna's place and, and pick up the rest of nursing. But I will tell you, and I don't know, you all can yay or nay, but um, I think this has been invaluable just as you've been speaking about to have the 
financial person to interpret all the financial terminology and what's going on, what's not going on, and give you the facts and then let you go forward and make some changes or revisions. So I think this is excellent. And, you know, it's really one point I want to make uh, is that we do this in nursing, but in nursing is the largest group of, of employees or staff or workers here in the hospital. But we have our other departments that need to do the same, correct? Because a lot of times we find nursing gets way out in front, which we already are, with doing our clinical financial analysis, but we have our other departments that are not. But we are doing that, and I think it has made a huge difference. Thank you. Good, thanks. And, you know, feel free, you've got this chart, we can give you the slide. I mean, it's, just, it's a nice example of, of something tying quality and cost, which is, I mean, that's I do think about. that's good because I don't think we have this format, and I think tying them together because we have them in different formats. Mm. This is a great slide, so I would Put like to have Put your age caps that. on there. Put your yes. what, whatever is most important to you. Now, you will know that uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, uh, several of the ACNOs met with uh, Mike Bettinger to get the scorecard, and this is pretty much what you will have on your scorecard, but I like the way this is laid out. So this is coming soon. <laughs> cool. So talk to me about how you schedule. Is it electronic or on paper? Electronic. Do you have to do much work with the schedule? How much time do you spend a month on the schedule? Days. And then sometimes, I mean, and you guys, I ask these questions because it helps me gauge what I fill in about the, the practice because different organizations have different levels of issues with some of this. I mean, when we think about what's happening with scheduling, we do have more vacancies. We've got higher turnover. Staff have, um, I would venture to say, more requests and preferences today than maybe 20, 25 years ago. You start thinking about even school schedules and, you know, um, all the things that go into that. We're under more financial constraints, you know, making sure that we don't schedule somebody overtime if we don't have to, et cetera. And I don't know, are you doing mostly 12-hour shifts or do you have four, six, eights, twelves, all of the above? Huh? All of the above, some say. Oh, that makes it much easier. Not, right? So it's about what is it that you have to do with the schedule versus what can you teach others to do? You're an electronic system. Do you still have to go in and correct the punches? Why are you doing that? Because people don't clock out. Oh, is that, I mean, I'm pushing the envelope here, I realize that. Is that their problem or our problem? It is kind of their problem, but who hears about it if their paycheck is short? You're the first one, right? So it, it becomes a matter of really th this idea of we can be our own worst enemies because we take things on and we do want to fix things and have it wonderful for everybody. How can we create an environment? You can't control other people, but you shape that environment that, that we get everybody playing their part, if you will. I can... The days before, and some of you may remember before electronic scheduling and back to good old time cards, I had a clerk that went through all of those and made all the changes and corrections and brought it to me and I just signed them all off. She called to my attention what might be different. As we've shifted to the electronic system, you know, in our wisdom, we thought, ah, we can get rid of those clerks and not have to deal with that, and the managers can just do that. But I don't know if we really estimated how much time might be a part of that. So those are the, those are the kinds of things I want you to begin thinking about. It's not that you're going to walk out of here today and, and totally upend things, but as you are doing your daily work, is this something that really requires 
my mind power or hiring you guys for the mental thought process and the critical thinking that's there, you know, or what do we do with that? Um, now, does anybody have a concept of self-scheduling? What, how do you, how do, how do your schedules work? Or, and Jan, if I'm not asking the question the right way, you, you jump in, please. So I know, I know for me um, and my staff, kind of what I did um, is I, I don't own the schedule as the director. I have, um, I think one of the best pieces of advice that I was given um, coming into administration by a manager that I had and loved was teach people to do your job better than you and then let them do That's it. That's a nice phrase. Um, yeah. And don't be afraid of letting them do it. Um, so it goes back to a succession plan or mentorship or however you want to look at it. So my, my CSLs on the schedule, um, I take on the accountability of setting the expectation out to all the staff and then supporting my CSL. They handle the schedule and then when it closes, I'm the one that goes back and just double checks and make sure. Make sure that it's meeting what the expectations so are in me. terms of the right skill mix and right. numbers of people on and et cetera. How about the rest of you? I'll call on somebody. Joanna, tell us what you do with, <laughs> what, how, how do you do your staffing, your schedule? How is that process? That used to be one of my favorite things to do because I'm kind of controlling about stuff like that. And you probably um, did a good job of it. I and I you felt good when you got it done. I did. Right? Yeah. Um, but like Janine, <laughs> I have turned it over to my CSLs. Okay. Um, and I do the same thing. Um, just kind of check over afterwards. Okay. Um, but yeah. Anybody have staff that are doing that check over rather than... CSLs? Question I want to ask. Sure. Do you think your CSLs have more time to do it than you do? No, they don't. They don't. You asked the perfect question. Who ever thought about assigning a staff? Why shouldn't staff do it? Set the, set the guidelines and it's done, right? I don't know. You might want to talk about it. Well, I, I mean, and I'm, I'm sorry to keep going back to past and paper days, but 30 plus years ago, I had a coronary care unit that wanted to try self-scheduling. The manager and I said, okay, but these are the expectations. You got to have this many on, and this is the skill mix, and people won't trade for overtime. And bottom line is, by the day it's due to us, if it's not in order, we will change it. And we went through probably a couple, three months of needing to make some changes and then got to the point that basically that schedule got turned in unless we had somebody who had a death in the family, a, a last minute. I mean, really, they, they took care of that. But it's about these are the expectations, and those expectations exist for a reason. Somewhere there's been evidence that this is what it should be to run your unit and, and, and go over. you got to think about, you know, you don't want that, you guys know this, you don't want that, night schedule to be all your newbies and no experienced person. You got to think about skill mix as well as tenure and what happens with nights, weekends, holidays. And Alice, if I could just jump in sure. here because I think this is very true because as I do rounds, I'm still not seeing as much and I wanted Joanna because she did share because I've seen a complete turnaround, I, not to point you out, but actually to point it out to say, I used to see Joanna with a pencil or a pen in hand and fretting over, well, I'm trying to call this one and this one, but I don't see that anymore. When I ran, she's able to do other things, so kudos to her. I'm, but, I'm curious how many people are here today with their clipboard with a copy of their schedule on it because something else has got to be done to it. I bet there's some, some hands that'll go up. Uh, yeah, excuse me, Jan. Um, but, but the thing is, it, it belongs to the staff and whether we believe it or not, after they learn what the guidelines are, you get people that are able to do it and they do it very well. We set up something in our pay for performance where they can get, you know, a level for doing this kind of thing. Leverage that and use it. It shouldn't be one person on the staff for the whole year does the staffing but maybe you do it for a schedule and then you pass it to the next one. It will not take too many times 
that something goes wrong or somebody's getting preferential staffing till that comes back to them. I saw this 15 years ago, 15 years ago, where people begin to turn over their scheduling, even Dana in critical care units where you think, and it was actually a CV unit, where you think, oh, oh no, I've got to make sure that this can do this, that this can do this, and we got CRT here, and we got ECMO here, and we got this in it. Let them figure it out. They have to work it. They have to do it. And like I say, after a couple of schedules, then you begin to see where it levels out, and people don't, don't try to mess with it or manipulate it so much. But as long as you will do it for them, you're going to get to do it for them. And that gives them the out. There's no accountability. I'll work my three days or I'll do what. I don't know what the unit really needs. I mean, I see what you post up there, but don't really think about that. But if I'm the one having to fill it out, and you know what? Next month, our next schedule, Linda's going to have to do it. That brings that accountability. So this is a pertinent piece. Well, and I, th I think one of the things truly that, that's happened you know, we, in so many areas of our work life, we've gone from paper systems to electronic systems, and we didn't exactly know what those workflows were going to need to be. And, and sometimes we probably created more work for our, so I'm not placing blame anywhere. We created more work just with the way we designed the system. But if you've been in it long enough, then that becomes the time to start to ask the question. This is um, a self-scheduling process that actually came to us from John Hopkins Aramico. John Hopkins Aramico is in Saudi Arabia. It is a, a U.S.-Saudi uh, joint partnership, large oil company. I, I've had the opportunity to, to go there and, and work with them. And um, as you drive onto the compounds, you would think that you were in one of our little, uh, you know, suburbs, uh, if you will. But staff does self-scheduling. They have a scheduling committee that's made up of some more senior nurses that understand what needs to happen, manager approves it, and then they use their central office to handle what do we do with the call-ins and that sort of thing. Now, one of the things that you've got to be aware of, like this overlapping leave request, do you have a guideline, for example, um, is your, I don't know if you call it benefit relief time or PTO or whatever, whatever percentage that is of like your total budget, is that what you use as a guideline for how many people can be off at once? I mean, thinking about, is that in line with, okay, yeah. So, you know, just knowing what your, your backgrounds are with that. They did a good job of establishing what the guidelines would be. You know, make sure that you've got two weekend shifts, make sure that the rotation, if they're doing rotating for nights, whatever. And then you see what scheduling committee does with their guidelines. They've significantly decreased the number of hours the managers have spent, and they've also decreased overtime hours from staff. People a lot of times hear self-scheduling or, or I go to present that, and we've tried that before, and the biggest thing is, well, we posted the guidelines, but nobody's sticking to it. Well, how do we get them to stick with it? And I think part of that is understanding where it came from and being serious about what it is that's going to happen, and that goes back to that ability of to have the difficult conversations, if you will. So maybe some fears with that. So in addition to going around and hunting for data, scheduling, what are th what other things do you guys do daily that could be handled some other way or by someone else? Can you think of anything? A lot of time spent uh, for service recovery as well, ah, okay. and I think that that could be something that could be shifted quite often, but it's often pushed to the directors or the leadership team to resolve. Okay, so like a patient complaint, unhappy family, et cetera? Ordering supplies. That's okay. What else? Yeah. Okay, coaching and development of staff. What would you let somebody else do of that? Yeah, Jocelyn, let's bring a mic, please. Um, probably about a year ago in emergency services, we actually um, aligned um, all of our staff 
with um, a CSL or assistant nurse manager okay. at the time. And so they were responsible for this subset of people to coach and develop. So if it's a new employee, they're the touch point to make sure that person is acclimating well to the to the environment, as well as there's a good relationship between the preceptor and the new employee. Um, and sometimes this is called educational opportunities. So if there's something missing in documentation or potentially they miss something in critical thinking, there's real time um, attention mm -hmm, placed mm -hmm. to that. Um, and it also gives them some ownership in developing the clinical skills of the team that they're gonna be overseeing, you know, on their shift. So it give, for us, it gave a lot of ownership. It's not just a director's responsibility to develop the team. And I just- But certainly your responsibility to coach those CSLs. Absolutely. And help give them guidance. Yeah. Right. What else? Quality rounds? <coughs> Tell me what all you include in quality rounds. Compliance with oh, okay. Compliance with bundles, hourly rounding, you know, general things that the nurse manager is out there, you know, trying to drive performance with staff. I think, you know, you have a little bit more buy-in if the, it's expected that the staff report to you what they've done around quality. So, I mean, what I want you to all think, think about you know, after being here today, it's just as you find yourself doing things in the course of a day, you know, is it something that could be done any differently? I think that becomes a question. You've been sitting long enough. You're ready for a break. We're at a good point for that. Um, we need, what, 15 minutes? 10? What? 10. 10? <laughs> Let's take about 10 minutes and we'll start back um, and go through some more practices. At Thank 1035. You. Thank you. Save your legs. Took away my job. Well, save your legs for a moment. Thank you. Oops. Forget sign in sheets. Jan's collecting them at the back. So, 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 so,
Anyway, I just I understand, you know, just <laughs> ideas or comments. Well, I mean, I think it, it takes a little bit of things back to the picture. What do you think? Is it the philosophy of the organization to plan their staff off the room? Is it more staff plus PTO you can hire into? Or where, where do you place all of the staff? If it's going to take, you know, 250 MTs of the community to take the population here, how are those all distributed? Yeah, that works for the people I don't see. I mean, I'm sure. 
we talk about it amongst ourselves. Um, yeah, that's very surprising. Anything I can do to encourage people to just call? But I, I've been doing it for so long that it's like I want it best for my knee. You know. Don't take a break. Really? Well, it's a bigger picture. Oh, absolutely. Good morning. Good morning. Can I make a comment? Absolutely. Okay, everybody, start walk, coming back in. I think everybody's coming. Good. See some nice drinks coming in. <laughs> Stay hydrated. Stay hydrated. Oh, I like it. <laughs> oh, jeez. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Oh, sorry. I scratched you. <laughs> He's doing good. He's we getting everybody back? 
PT told him yesterday, I don't know why we're coming. He's going up and down our stairs. Oh, yeah. All the nurses raved about how good of a patient he was. So. Oh, well, he knows. He knew. <laughs> well, and I'm going to do something for the staff. I just can't figure out what to do. You know, I know they get lots of pizza and stuff like that. I don't know. You have to tell me what you think might be good. But in the next couple of days, I need to do something, not let it get too far away. I've got to tell Christy, too, in all the different places, the areas. Yeah, yeah. But they were talking about how good he was. So. Oh, well, good. Well, they were good. They were just a... right now for summer interns. We're going to... So what kinds of questions or ahas came up over break? The schedules. The schedules? <laughs> okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Good. I like it. Anybody want to talk in the microphone? <laughs> what came up about schedules? Uh, uh, we're going to do with the staff first and then, you know, pass it on to the CSLs and the, and the directors to look over. But because we always have a few staff members that always notice that she does never change her days. Yeah. And <laughs> so I'm going to start with the one who complains the most and let her be the first one who kick it off. Okay. Other things that came up over break. Is everybody back on offsite? Yeah, I Again, think we, and had I were... we had most everybody up. Okay, good. A minute ago. There we go. So we were talking about at the break, Jan and I, about we have multiple, as we've lost CSLs, we have very few applicants. One, sometimes zero, sometimes two, but very few applicants. And... And or so what? You have very few applicants. Just the, just the fact in you, that you do, aren't getting those applicants, and do you wonder what you could do differently to get applicants? I think that, honestly, I think in our situation, the CSL see how hard we work, and they don't want to take that responsibility. But also, you know, if you have zero applicants, then you're going to have that, that role vacant. What's the supply, nursing supply, like in this area? You know, Not I think so we have a, well, we have a lot of nursing schools. Uh, we have a lot of feeders in here. Our problem is we have, uh, we actually have an exclusive nurse practitioner program. We have CRNA school. We have a lot of schools. So we're coming up on the time here in April or May that we will lose a lot of nurses to of higher education. I mean, I counted last year, what was it, 60 that we lost, 60 nurses. Just six going, zero? Six zero, yes. So that's a big void to fill. We have our residency program, which has helped us tremendously to fill the void, but it's uh, like Tracy was alluding to, I think, a lot of young nurses. And then to put them in a CSL role, it really puts them at a disadvantage because you know they're they're rather weak because they haven't had the training as and maybe the trial by the fire to uh, get through some of these situations. Our supply is good, but it's we lose so many. It's hard to sometimes supply uh, doesn't get up to the demand. You keep up with all of that. Yeah, I mean one of the things that that weighs on my mind when we think about supply and demand is if you just look at the demographics of um, those of us that are baby boomers as an example that are getting older the generations behind us just are not as large people have tried to map out even if we had the same percentage of people go into healthcare professions there are not enough of them to assign care the way we assign care now. And I think that big question becomes, so what are we doing about it? And are we piloting creative ways of delivering care? And 
you know, uh, if you get to the point there's a surplus of those nurse practitioners, how do you even use them in the, as a part of the inpatient team? Or what else can we deal with with other roles and electronics? Um, I, I've always had a belief that the individual has a choice. And that that choice is about doing something about it or not. And that's probably where my asking for, okay guys, talk more, <laughs> is all about. Because if you don't raise the issues and talk about it in a constructive fashion, not a defensive one, but a constructive fashion of, well, what could we do about it? How do we analyze it? You guys know nursing process. We assess and we plan and we implement and evaluate. So use that same thing in your leadership roles in terms of where we go and what's working, not working. It, it um, That's going to be a challenge to have enough people to always get them get there. So how are we going to deliver care? Well, let's move into thinking about where are some other ways that, that we can use folks. This is moving out of that sense of not so much what you do, but what are some other pinch points? And where do we have people that can help with, and we're calling it back office work, I'll talk about it in a minute, and some of the other things that have to happen to keep the organization going. Our organizations are much more complex than they used to be, and we have a whole lot of administrative rules and regs to meet that weren't out there in the past. And it's made a difference in the number of people we have in, in different roles. Now, we did a study several years ago in talking about best-in-class nursing organizations and ways to think about organizing work, so we're not repeating any of that. But here's some of the things that we're talking about when we think about back office work, if you will. Do your, do your clinical staff leaders do evaluations? Are they, are they, from a labor relations perspective, considered management? Yes? Yes, okay. So how many staff evals might they have to do? How many staff report directly to them? Five? Ten? Sixty? So if you've got how many CSLs on your area? Five? You have 300 staff? In OK. OK. OK, good. Okay. Alice, I need to clarify something. In, uh, Go ahead. The clinical staff leads, which we have many of them here, they are not, from the labor standpoint, considered management because they are hourly. But we are, from the leadership standpoint, they are clinical staff leaders. So just remembering that point because th that's why we put them, left them as hourly rather than salaried. So from the labor standpoint, they're not management, but they are in leadership. So, well, and that, and uh, yeah, let's not go down the path with all those rules. Right. But the, the point is when we talk about the work to be done, like, like performance evals, it's one thing to have 40 FTEs that you're responsible for. That easily can be 60, 70 people. And thinking about that whole piece, you talked about service recovery, incident reports. Going to meetings, committees, schedules, reviewing, interviewing, hiring. Is there work that you have to be kind of in your office and doing to follow up with this that potentially can be done by others? I guess then that becomes the question. Here's an example from Vanderbilt. They looked at what they wanted to do. Anybody here worked? I mean, if somebody's worked one of these places, I hope they'll, they'll say something with this. But... Um, they, they looked at what they had with their assistant nurse managers, their nurse manager, the assistant nurse managers, and their charge nurses. Um, how could they better use that role? And they're using that title, clinical staff leader. You see they created that business coordinator to report to the nurse manager and then had that clinical staff leader. Now, does that replicate, except that you, don't, you haven't always done the business coordinator? Right. We're, we're doing the business coordinator. It's evolving. Right. We had one, but we're now we're replacing that uh, with another one. 
uh, the nurse manager would be the nurse director in your clinical staff leads. In fact, we use the same uh, job description as Vanderbilt used for their clinical staff lead. I want to go back and touch on something because I'm sure. not sure we're consistent here. And you, it's so good. I'm glad you're bringing these things up. Um, but our clinical staff leads should have, I think we put in the job description, if y'all will look, the ones that worked on that job description, that they would have it five people that they're currently mentoring was it five staff so that when you think about it the, i mean they're mentors of the entire staff but you're picking at least five that they're working with and doing things and those are the job to evaluations you can't i shouldn't say that should we overload them so they just pass the overload somewhere else so we've got to look at that because they're only mentoring five should be at the time your clinical staff leads according to our job description so and 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 the i guess the thought that goes through my mind dan as i hear you talk about that you guys are the leadership team for your unit who are my folks that are like in direct nursing director roles managers you you've got 24 7 accountability for an area has anybody ever told you that you are the chief executive officer of the area you have I mean, that is where we're moving to from a nursing management perspective. And who are my folks that the directors report to? So are they service line? What's the uh, uh, ACNOs or? ACNOs. Okay, so where are you guys? There's two for this campus. And One, there's, two, three, or, there's four. There's children's house. And so it really becomes a question of thinking through what is, what is your role in developing that manager so they are functioning? as the CEO. To give you an example from a totally unrelated, well, an industry. Um, <laughs> so my daughter Kenna is in her first official supervisor role, okay? Um, and I'm just real proud of her at the age of 25. But she went to work for this company and her first promotion put her into the, to a job, thank heavens that was empty, um, the title, and I told her when she came home with this, I said, I want to see that on your resume a few years from now. Her title was Nest Coach. Yeah, you guys know, I, Mom was going, what, what, is a, what is a Nest Coach? Well, she was very good at the role she was doing, and so her job as a Nest Coach was to get up to about 20 individuals once they finished their orientation, and she rotated her schedule to work side by side with them to, you know, review calls, to review documents, to she was their coach until they were performing at a level that they could go do that job. She's had some nice orientation and I, I said to her one day, I said, so, so what? Where have your coaching resources come from? And how have you learned about this? And what, what's your biggest lesson? And she says to me, she said, you know how grandma, my mom, she's always told us that we were blessed with two ears and one mouth and to use them in that proportion. Honestly, my mother said that to all six of us and it followed to the next generation. She said, I think that's what I've learned. I've got to listen and learn how to ask questions, not always provide the answer. Because if I ask the right question, most people have the answer inside of them. And I really liked that response. And I think about that with those of you that are in, you know, ACNO type roles in what you're doing to develop direct, uh, yeah, directors and directors to CSLs. And, you know, nobody's to, to blame for what we deal with with the situation. We got to describe it to, to move forward. The kinds of things that were put in this case study, looking at what happens with those back office duties, they made an impact on how many people were directly reporting and, you know, took some accountability um, for other people to work on unit initiatives. It gets back to that sense of how do you have time to lead? And that goes, I'm sure, for the CSLs who you may think uh, this is supposed to be my office day and yet I'm short three nurses. How am I going to spend it in the office? You ever feel that? You know, and so balancing all those demands, which becomes a question then of who can help and who can do something with this. Um, I think 
and, and, I, and I like this piece talking about hiring decisions for clinical staff leaders. When you talk with me about the fact that I'm not getting many applicants for those CSL jobs, the, my doctor works organization development. And so what that kind of says to me is, oh, well then what are we doing when we see folks that may be good potential CSLs, what are we doing to coach and develop? Did that door just come open? Okay, thank you. I thought, <laughs> I thought, oh my, what am I seeing over there? You know, what are we doing to introduce this role to them and, um, and prepare them? You know, I'm, I'm convinced I ended up in my first charge nurse role because I was the oldest of six kids and I'd always been in leadership positions in, in school and whatnot, you know? Um, you see those folks that come in and maybe they're saying, well, I'm going to go to nurse practitioner school. But it also becomes a question of, have you ever thought about some other ways to be involved in the organization? Basically, Vanderbilt felt like they saw some real positives in restructuring. Now, this role of lateral nurse consultants was one that Augusta University did. And looking at how they could use people with all of the work we have to do today on quality indicators, our finance stuff, the pieces that go back, how can we spread some of that, spread some of that around? Let's get more people involved, if you will. They had a, a large cadre of clinical educators and took them and sort of subdivided those roles, if you will. Looked at who are, the, and I don't know, Who's, education's here today, I think. Direct, okay. How are you organized? That mic's right behind you. Oh, Jocelyn's got it. Um, we have recently, in the last six months or so, centralized our clinical educators. So they're in one centralized cost center, but basically assigned out to service lines or departments. So we meet to coordinate organizational education, and then they are in their departments to handle the department specific service line education. Okay. And so directors and CSLs, do you view those educators as your best friends? And are they a part of your leadership team? I mean, I would hope because that that they may be in an education role, but it's certainly seen by staff as a leadership role. Augusta took their educators and identified there's core. We got to orient people. Let's get through that. Their residency, their research. They focused on their division, so it may be, you know, adult and peds, maybe an adult you've got critical care, med surge, whatever. And then they identified clinical outcomes managers. Now, this is an organization that didn't have a, a lot of times we find these folks in quality departments, but they're gathering a lot of that data and they're feeding it back to staff in terms of how are we doing. If I were to go make rounds when we finish today and walk down a hall and ask on a given unit, what's your biggest challenge from a quality perspective? Could they tell me? And if I ask the question, what are you doing really well at? You know, it's that sense of, I think, getting people better aligned with what it is that, that has to, to happen. For them, it was a matter of narrowing the focus. And let's get people directed towards a goal they weren't reporting, but were certainly the partners of um, their nurse managers. And, you know, it's a matter of you can designate wherever that goes with um, the finance piece. And you see a little bit how they identified what, what went to different people in terms of these folks were helping with the quality piece, if you will. So really taking ownership of that, that key metric. Somebody brought up the issue of, of perhaps some of the quality rounding being able to be done by someone else. This is an organization that hired some retired nurses who, you know, we, we may still be bright of mind, but our bodies get more tired trying to work an eight, 12 hour shift. This is a pseudonymed organization, but they hired two retired nurse managers. They covered five units. They loved it. And, you know, it was their single focus to round on folks. Now, some organizations will say, no, my managers need to know that information. Others will say, no, somebody can do it. That's going to depend a little bit on your culture. But that's where you all take the information from today and be able to discuss and think about where it's going to go from that. It made a positive, very positive impact on HCAP's scores. And... 
when we start thinking about what happens with spanish control and this is that sense of the difference with when, when we do our annual survey benchmark survey for spans of control you know nursing typically has more people given the size and we have that represented with the the spectrum of folks but we also are targeting towards hiring more and more well-educated individuals so this comes out of our 2015 study, but the average number of FTEs that a nurse manager was dealing with. Here's an example of what Cincinnati Children's did in reorganizing how they had things put together, if you will. Again, trying to look at how much of your workload is coming from outside your unit and what of that is actually what you have to do with the people that actually report to you. Do you guys have these in your handout, the same slide? We've got a couple. I, We've got a couple of versions of this program, so making sure what, what, what's what. So some, some real positives after standardizing. That sort of takes that section of unclogging the drain. I'm trying to get the work done. I can't get it through the whole system. Um, what else comes to your mind? <coughs> Jan, or could I ask somebody to grab me another water bottle, please? Thank you so much. And just dry. Do I need to ask your ACNOs to plug their ears? <laughs> Clinical staff leaders, what are your biggest frustrations? Thank you so much. Does she know you're pointing at her behind her? <laughs> okay. I would just say the biggest frustration I have is the responsibilities, non-clinical responsibilities that I hear in meetings like this that I should be doing or have, not necessarily for my director at all, but and then working on the floor 80 hour or 80 percent of the time, but with all these other things, I feel like it's hard to manage those two things. Which goes back to that whole how do how do if this is the work if this is the number of patients the acuity of patients etc we have to take care of how do you plan all of the resources for the organization and Lynn and I were talking a little bit about this the fact that you have responsibility as a CEO perhaps for your unit but you've also got to look at the whole because somebody's having to balance those resources overall and if we if we want people to have time that they're not not knowing how you plan things on ratios or hours per patient day. I mean, really thinking through what is it that's all the work that's got to be done. Um, and I'll be the first to advocate for what needs to be done for direct care. But I also know that sometimes we can, work will always expand to the time available <laughs> rather than are we really concise with it. So it takes a very deliberate planning approach to deal with the kind of problem you're talking about. Um, Lynn? I think the other thing, too, is that we have to be um, synced in everybody doing the exact same thing on every floor so that employees don't go, oh, well, Lynn's doing it this way, but Leslie's doing it this way, and her way's easier, so I'm going there. What, what's, your, what, what's your reaction to that? Comment over here. So I... I don't have a CSL in my department. It's a little bit different because I'm managing the trauma program and not. So you're a program coordinator. Correct. Gotcha. But I have 12 um, trauma nurses underneath me as well as other people. Gotcha. But I was actually a CSL in the Vanderbilt system. And the thing that I find most different about their, how the role was there versus how the role appears to be here. Uh -huh. Again, I don't have a CSL. So just from the outside looking in is that the focus was a lot more on leadership non-clinical role at Vanderbilt for the CSL and the focus here seems to be on more clinical. So if there is not enough staff, the CSL would get pulled into staffing or would take patients. And I think that that may be good if that's what you know we're going for as an organization, but if we're looking for them to take more of a leadership role and focus on things like this, it does make it a little bit more difficult. It was also very streamlined 
the CSLs are responsible for this, 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 and right. this, and it was divided work among them, and it was the same on every floor. So to go with what Lynn said, when it's different on different floors, it does probably make it confusing. Okay, I appreciate you sharing that. What else? Anybody in here just bristle when you hear it's gotta be standardized throughout the whole house? Because you wanna do it your way. I can remember bristling at that because critical care areas had a way of doing things that when it was, and, and so I, I think the thing that, you know, over time, there are some things that really do need to be standardized and probably some things that we can have some small, you know, deviations, but it makes a difference for patient outcomes as well as, you know, what you're thinking of with your, with your staff outcomes. Why do we standardize anything? Why have, why have we been inundated in our practices over the last years with standards and protocols and policies and pathways and what else do you call them? Best practice, so what's that mean? Provides the best outcome. The idea of having things standardized is if we follow that process, it increases our opportunity to get the best outcome. And so what that says is if you are not getting the outcome you want, you need to revise the process or the standard. I mean, what goes with that? That applies for your work as well. The things you standardize to get to the outcome of the work that you're doing, if it's working, fabulous. If it's not, then it's time to revisit. Does that make sense? There's a diagram in our accountability piece that, that talks a lot about that. Well, let's talk about turning off the faucet. You know, at least maybe turning it down just a little bit, if you will. First thing comes all of those requests that come up from above. Um, what can potentially be done with that that's organization-wide? If you look at the side of the slide with all the red lettering, you probably have a whole lot of those things that are on your lists, maybe more. The thing that's happening outside of our organizations is all of these market forces that are pushing us to act very differently and to shape things differently. People are not deciding on these programs just because it sounds like a fun thing to do. It's in response to something that's happening out there. So if we think about this, and all of the different programs that might be out there. You got a quality officer, a nursing officer, an HR officer, a finance officer, and probably all kinds of others. And do you ever feel like that person in the middle with all the arrows coming at you? Because each one of them have their various priorities that they're responsible for, right? So how do you, I, whoops. How do you in that respond? What, what we really want to look at is, and I think the point of this is the integration where those, where those circles are overlapping, how does that culture of safety actually relate to our engagement? Staff don't want to work in an organization they don't perceive as safe. How does it tie into our finance? How are we taking a coordinated approach to all of that? And that's what this section's about. When we look at, this is St. Elizabeth in Kentucky and where they've gone with their engagement profile and that question of likelihood to recommend, they've really worked on what are those issues that would be the intersection of all our different specialties and our plans how does that tie into what we're doing? If we want to improve staff engagement, we also want to improve our patient satisfaction. I've already said to you that, you know, they're terribly interrelated. Part of what they found through their engagement index was what the, what the overlap part was. People want to know that their jobs are secure or one of the drivers, do the actions of the execs and the senior leaders reflect our mission and values? You know, so it's how do we tie it all together and not look at just, you know, where we are uh, in, in one little area. Here's an example. When you think about what's here with job security, 
they're looking at two different pieces as an example, a 90-day communication plan and a benchmarking review. Now, HR has responsibility for both of those. That's fine. But when we look at actions of the executives, there may be something that the chief operating officer is focusing on that's very different than what the CEO is focusing on. So trying to integrate all of those different activities. I'll bet if you all looked at your to-do list, you would find overlap between some of the different things that are happening and or some redundancies. That's what we want to look at being able to take out of, out of work. This is a project around a predetermined project routing. Do you ever get a project and you wonder if this is really mine to do or could it potentially go somewhere else? What are the categories that projects fit into? And that's what this is about. And then how do we really prepare leaders for success? This organization identified, okay, and this is Intermountain, very large, very sophisticated, shared governance process, staff very involved. They have their practice councils, their leadership council, their engagement council. So they knew that as projects came up, we aren't just going to create a new committee. It's probably going to go to one of these councils, and each of those councils has their core leader that's going to follow through on that. You're kind of shaking your head. What are you thinking about? Oh, Mike coming. Gentlemen. I was dozing off a little bit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, your eyes look, you must be really good at that. <laughs> no. Um, we've worked around and tried to get this started, uh -huh. but you know, it all comes down to that one core leader coming from the units, and that's one of the things that we've always struggled with is that representative from each of the units having a say because it ended up being all the directors and everybody in the room, and it's kind of just the same thing repeated over and over and over. And over. So I think that's one of the pieces that we always missed was the actual unit representative. Getting really involved and having that, that voice. And driving that change. Why do you think they were not involved? Unit directors? Yeah. I think like we already said, a lot of times they plan to be involved and then they get pulled into well, staffing. staffing. So for instance, lately flu has really been hurting us with our staff. So we have days that we have three and four call-ins on one shift. So if we have a CSL or somebody that's going to a committee, then we're going to pull them and say, hey, we need you on the floor. And so even though that committee is super important, the staffing is the priority at that time. And if you're like everybody else, it's not just you've got call-ins of staff, but you've also got more and more patients than ever before and trying to find a place to put them and et cetera. And, you know, those times are going to happen. And I think one of the things that's hardest for us is realizing when is it truly that high acuity time versus when could we possibly get something done. Yeah. So something that I've noticed in our department, and it's probably a good problem, but it's a problem. Uh, we promote, you know, our staff to further their uh, their education, their career, and so the uh, percentage of staff that they're working because they have to work, but yet every moment out of here they're studying, they're in the other clinicals, they just don't have any additional time, uh, and in our department. I looked at July of 2015 to this year, I've lost 15 to nurse practitioners. So we are just constantly, and, and every one of them we had hired as new nurses. And we have, you know, they've been in our department. But when I looked at my compliment July of 15 to now, 15 to nurse practitioners. So they're, I mean, it's not that they don't want to, and they would be so valuable, but they just, their time is limited. I have a couple of questions, I think, in response to that. Are th is there a high enough shortage? And I mean, the, the nation's shortage of primary care providers is just getting worse year by year. Are there enough jobs for all those folks as they come out as nurse practitioners? No. Okay. Which we're beginning to see in some areas that have really pushed that graduate education. 
And so the question becomes, those are advanced practice nurses. How can we still potentially use them and create roles that work? And, you know, I guess that's the whole question piece. The, the other thought, and, and I'm Can I'm I not, add just one oh, clarification? Sure. Sorry. I think it depends on what type nurse practitioner. Acute care okay. nurse practitioners are still in demand. Gotcha. Family nurse practitioners many times cannot get placement for okay. a couple of years. And... Psych. And this is, this Psych is, is in practice. demand nationally. Go ahead. I Psych something. is in demand nationally. Is it here? And neonatal? No. Not a lot. Pediatric? No. Do you ever wonder why the public's confused about all our different roles? Anyway. Exactly. I heard yeah. someone over. Esther? Oh. Esther? Hey, Jan. Thank I, you. I, I, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, this semester I'm doing, I'm working with actually Dr. Pam Hardesty at UT Knoxville on, a, on her, I'm doing a lit review for her and one of the, she's trying to decide what her research question is going to be, but one of the things that I'm looking at is why are people looking to go into that nurse practitioner role and I'm having a hard time finding much literature about it. Like, when are they making the decision to go? What is driving them? So I've looked at different things, and just nurses leaving the bedside in general, a lot of it has to do with uh, poor management, and they're feeling overwhelmed. But as far as going to nurse practitioner school, I think it's a power thing that it's, it's sort of a theme because there's an opportunity for them to, you know, if it's there, then they, they have a, a chance to feel better with their clinical skills and all of that. So I don't, I don't know that we know why they're making the decision necessarily to, to become nurse practitioners, but I think my researcher is wanting to know just what you said, how can we, how can we keep nurses at the bedside that even have higher, you know, educations and they have those aspirations to become better clinical specialists, to become better um, educated. But I'm having a little hard time with the lit review to find out exactly why um, they're, they're wanting to do it necessarily. Esther, it, would it be, with the research you're trying to do, would it be appropriate to actually do some interviews of faculty? I think she's going to look at some interviews, but I'm doing the lit review piece, okay. and we haven't actually come up with the research question yet, so I don't know that I'll be a part of that for the semester, but um, I'm also looking at traits, like uh, uh, something that I brought up to my researcher is we are, we are recruiting the best and the brightest in nursing now, so, you know, especially... They're, they're having high ACT scores, they're making straight A's, you know, those are the people that we're recruiting to be nurses. So if you have that opportunity for them to advance, a lot of them are very competitive, so maybe that might be driving them. You know, it's like, well, if I can do this, I'm going to do it. We're, I don't know, I, I can't find research on necessarily those characteristics yet, but it almost seems like it's more of a power thing. They want to, they have the opportunity, they want to get the education, they want to be better in their field, and they're disenchanted with just bedside nursing. They, I think that it looks like, well, maybe I won't have to work weekends, maybe I won't have to work holidays. I think they think that, but I don't, I don't know that that's always the case. But I'm having a lot of trouble with the lit review. It's not, there's just not a lot out there uh, for that. And, and I think one of the things, I appreciate your comments, one of the things that happens, have any of you published? How long does it take from the time you do that first manuscript until it gets published? Our, when we go to do a lit review, it's several years behind what's happening in practice. And that's, that's why I raised the issue. It would be interesting to do some discussions, especially with, with faculty. Yeah. I went to a conference this week, and one of the big things they talked about was compassion fatigue. Ah and burnout and the last couple of conferences I've been to they talk a lot about burnout and that especially critical care ED nurses have the same signs and symptoms of PTSD but in all of these things that you go to there's no real how do we combat the burnout or the fatigue it's there's suggestions but it's still I think that's one reason people want to get away from the bedside because the burnout essentially just taking care of these sick patients over and over and over again 
with no relief almost. And, and I think one of the things, I, I agree with Esther's comment about they, they think maybe I'll find a day shift job Monday through Friday in office. Oh my goodness, have you worked in an office on a Monday or a Friday? I mean, it's not eight hours with all the calls that are there and whatnot. We are seeing, we're beginning to see turnover in new nurse practitioners who get into this and say, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And so my question, how do we use these educated people to help grow and develop some of the folks that, that we've got? Um, I, I'm not going to forget about you over there. I do have a comp compassion fatigue survey that we used on the international side that is something that you can distribute, you can take it for yourself. You can evaluate your staff with it. You can share it for them. And it does help to pinpoint, I, Jan, I can send it to you if okay, great. people would think if you're interested. It's at least a, and I'm trying to think, I think I got it from some of the Norwegian countries, but um, a way to at least start to pinpoint what is it that's pulling at you so much. Do, do you have access to an EAP? And are you using that when somebody's in crisis or are they coming in routinely and talking and working with all of your staff? What are we doing proactively? We tend to respond, we do a lot of things for stress and burnout, but we tend to do it reactively rather than proactively. We could talk more and more about that. But anyway, up, yeah. So sorry to talk so much. No. But, um, so there are multiple nurse practitioners that are AVPs in this room, um, which I think Jan's done a great job of, of utilizing that. But I think to say each individual person that goes back to school goes back for a different reason. So for instance, when I first looked at nurse practitioner school 15 years ago, nurse practitioners were not recognized in the area. They were only making about 50,000. They weren't able to write many prescriptions and the hospitals weren't utilizing them. When I went back to school six years ago for my nurse practitioner, it had changed drastically. When I was looking for jobs in management, actually at the time, when you looked on the job boards, there were multiple nurse practitioner jobs. And so the reason at the time that I chose to do it was that that is what was available. Mm -hmm. um, there weren't other jobs available. So I think each individual person, you know, you look at cardiac. We have multiple cardiac nurse practitioners. We have multiple hospitalist nurse practitioners. We have ER nurse practitioners. So the world has broadened, yeah. which is why we have them. Um, I do think, at least at this point, we have flooded the area um, with family nurse practitioners. Like Bill said, acute care is needed, psych is needed but family is not as needed. But I think that that's why we're gonna to continue to lose people because then they're seeing their peers in these different jobs and now they make appropriate rages. Um, so. And I, I wanna add something along those lines. This may come kind of shocking to you, but coming from me, y'all will not be shocked when I say this. But um, you know, one thing I think and, and Bill Crow is here, and Bill, um, Dr. Crow, is actually over our acute care nurse practitioner program at UTC. Now, the thing that I have questioned with the director of the School of Nursing over there is that we gave you exclusive, we, we do exclusive with our, the nurse practitioner program as far as if we can fill up the program with Erlanger folks, that's what we're going to do. But since we're doing that for academia, what is academia going to do to replace nurses? We're giving them nurses. That's what we're doing. We're giving them nurses. But how are they helping us replenish back? So uh, I'm almost, and I'm, she thinks that I'm kidding, but when I talk to uh, Dr. Chris Smith at UTC, but I'm really not kidding because I want to know how are we getting back. You know, it's not a, a given that we get those nurse practitioners back. I mean, they some of them are on scholarship and they will come back. But... What, how, how can we work with the schools to say, okay, we're going to give you the instructors, and, and a lot of us in here are on faculty at UTC sure. and Chattanooga State and whatever, but we're, we're going to give you uh, these students for higher learning, but are you going to give us some nursing students back in exchange? So it's kind of a new thought process in the exchange. We'll see how she reacts. Don't anybody go tell her I mentioned it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, need, so I need to have some leveraging. I time. met William. You mentioned Dr. Crow. Is that one and the same person? Yes. Gotcha. Is. I forget, and I should refer to him as Dr. Crow in a, <laughs> at a meeting like this, but I, I get to thinking, and I forget. But anyway, yes, same person. I mean, uh, my son graduates from nursing school in May. Yay. Yes, I, I couldn't be a more proud mom, and boy, have I been a pain in the butt. Uh, to him, I'm sure, in terms of all the questions. But he's worked for probably at least eight years now in about a 100-bed, highly, highly acute, freestanding psychiatric hospital. And that's what prompted his decision to switch from another major into nursing. And I'll never forget the morning he came by and said, I think I need to do nursing, but I also think it's going to need at some point to be advanced practice and he's got a couple of fabulous role models. But I've talked with him a lot and kind of back to Esther's point about the literature, he has got so many uh, students in his class that are talking about wanting to go. They, they joke about, I'm going to walk across the stage, I'm going to get my diploma and pick up my application for graduate school. It just goes with that. And, and the comments I've heard back from, from some of those young folks is, you know, we are encouraged from day one that we are bright, we have the ability, the biggest contribution is going to be from advanced practice. That's why I say we've got to be talking a lot with our faculties about also what is it that nurse leaders do. And I'm a huge advocate for having nurses with advanced education in nursing that are also serving, you know, then in those leadership roles. But we've got some different kind of Dyna dynamics, I agree, that are taking place with all of this. Um, this is the routing process that Intermountain uses. I appreciate all, I really appreciate the discussion. The fact that they know with this leader coordination council it's going to go to practice leadership or engagement. I remember first starting shared governance and I was one of those uh, gung-ho young managers that I wanted everybody involved in something. And then I learned there's this thing called life that goes on, right? And whether it's going back to school, it's family, it's elder patients, uh, I mean elder parents, it's, you know, most of our work has showed if you can have maybe 10% of your staff that are really involved, and if they know who they're representing and who they need to get information back and forth to, it doesn't always if you can find those right key leaders, it doesn't have to always be masses that are a part of what you're doing with, with councils, at least. That, that's been a lot of the discussion, bless you. Um, thinking about what you do to set leaders up for time, and you, you've talked it a lot about the, the difficulty with protected time even for your clinical staff leaders. And, how are, when you, as an example, when you budget, do you plan for the time that people are going to be off at conferences so that you've got that built into your relief time? And, you know, it gets into a big picture, and we're not here to do a, a finance people today, but uh, how do we plan for this time that we want to try to, to take things, um, to get other people involved? A little bit about how they're equipped to do things. I'm thinking about where I want to go with some of this. So it's about trying to coordinate what all comes at you from, um, from up above. When we talk about lateral seepage, this is figuring out where does everything come from. Some of the, the off the record, the comments that we got. I'm calling environmental services all day long about the trash. You said, I order, I spend forever ordering supplies. Are your PAR levels up to date? You know, um, I keep calling transport, and by golly, if I got a patient that's got to go somewhere and there's nobody here from transport, who's going to take them? We are, because we're going to make sure it gets done, right? Um, how do we identify what, you know, what, what these issues are? Besides ordering supplies, what are some of the things that you find you repeatedly have to deal with? Dietary. Environmental services? I'm sorry? We spend a lot of time cleaning our own rooms. Time cleaning rooms, which goes environmental services, I assume, would do that? I was, I, I hope you'll take this in the fun spirit that it's in, intended. We go to, we call those other departments to talk with them about, I need you guys cleaning my rooms. Make sure my supplies are, right? 
we, we need that. I was at a very southern organization, and this very senior nurse, my age or, or older, I'm sure, spoke up, and she says, well, you know, we, we kind of have this thing about being nice in the South when we try to problem solve. And she says, we need to learn how to take our dentures out before we start that conversation. <laughs> Her comment was, sometimes we got to bite, bite a little bit. The, the bottom line is, do those other areas understand the impact on patients? It's not about the nurse. It's not really about what your nurses are having to do. It's not about their staff. It is about what's happening to our patients. Um, a couple of people talk, ED, do you, do you want somebody laying on a cart that they can see a blood spot on? Or, you know, you're cleaning that room, but you're delaying patients to get to that room that need to be admitted. What, where is your biggest risk area in the organization? Anyone want to venture a guess? Somebody's saying ER, and it's actually your ER waiting room. You know, ideally the goal is an empty waiting room because you don't know what's happening to that guy with chest pain sitting over in that back corner. But then the next piece is getting people moved up. Did you know that organizations that have wait times in their emergency departments have higher mortality rates? Emory University did a study working on communication, interprofessional communication. And they did a bunch of training with all their staff. The metric they used to measure was mortality. That's what I mean when we talk about, talk about outcomes. So, you know, thinking about how can we get people to problem solve, but make it about the impact on our patients and families. It's not, it's not about us. We think it is. But, you know, it's really, it's about what happens to our patients. Um, the three practices here, this external demand surfacing and a staff-triggered response and then shared accountability. This is a practice that one of our, um, Cole Edmondson in, in Texas does, and he wanted to get a better handle of who are my people that are calling materials management all the time or environmental services or facilities or whatever. Why, where are we not working truly as a, as a complete team? So we established these conversations with Cole. He is available for a block of time. Um, managers attend. The walls here are all kinds of things, but conversations will no, not go on as you move out. It's a chance for him as the CNO to truly understand where do I have gaps in what we truly are providing for our patients and families. I was uh, up north recently with an organization and the CNO told a story. Um, he found out when he went to this organization that his staff nurses were putting together all of the welcome kits for patients. The toothbrush, toothpaste, comb, razor, that kind of stuff. So he said, I got to see what this is about. And he went to watch one of the units while they put together all their welcome packs and he's picking up and he just wasn't pleased with the quality of the products. So he took them home, used them over a weekend, said he came in the next week with band-aids all over his face from the poor quality of razors. And his way to deal with that, because he felt like they'd had a lot of discussions, was to create gift bags for all of his executive colleagues and take them to a meeting and ask them to use those gift bags for a week to see, is this, our, is this what we're really about for our patients and families? It's, it's about us all being on the same team, I think, for what gets done. Um, it's not a pity party. It's not being the victim. It's so, if this is a problem, what can we do about it? And being very proactive with that. Cole's created a very safe space, you know, be able to look at what it is that you're, you're dealing with. And, you know, he has a starter question set. You know, how do you spend? How do you spend your time managing cross-disciplinary issues? One of the things that I've had brought up in a couple of organizations with this program is the, the shift they feel as the organization goes back and forth with using contracted services to provide a lot of those ancillary services versus hiring their own staff. And I've had a real mix. 
Some folks who've said when we have the contracted staff, we have better service. Some saying when we have our own, we have better service. So bottom line is, if what is it that you or the patient are dealing with? And we've just talked a little bit here about this whole communication loop and what goes through with that. <coughs> Candidly, I think the, the this idea of a st of staff triggered responses is very important. I think the example that we have in here is getting a little bit old, but it's the idea you get requests from all kinds of different people, right? And they expect you to get the information. What do you, where do you go? What do you do with that and whatnot? The org the the example we have here is from um, Freightert and something they put in place a while ago. Their organizational policy was such that if a staff person felt threatened on a given unit, they had to call their manager before security would be called. And I see heads shaking, and so please understand that's why I'm saying I think this is old. But the lesson is, what is it that your staff need to protect themselves and their patients, and can they get it directly? And I think that's the point of identifying where is there an unnecessary step of needing to get hold of, of, of a leader. And I think this serves as a, as a good example. I don't think many of us in today's environment, you know, would tolerate this. But where else do you have situations of facilities won't come change the light bulb unless you call them as the CSL? Or where are those kind of situations in your organization? So they've had a good result with that. When we think about working with our interdisciplinary partners, you know, it, nursing, it, I had a, a, a fabulous mentor who always said nursing is omnipresent. We're there 24-7, 365, and in all kinds of healthcare communities, if you will. But we don't provide patient experience alone. It really is this whole environment that we put together, and we look at some of the reasons that people have to chase folks down. One of the questions we have to ask is, are we all working towards the same goals? Or sometimes are our goals not in alignment with one another? Do you ever have, you know, I went down the path of a, a, a surgeon who was bound and determined to turn one particular unit into our bariatric program, and yet that wasn't on our strategic plan yet. Are we working towards the same things? Are we looking at, here we've got a decrease in length of stay. We're looking at what time to get patients out so we can clean rooms and get them in. Again, a, a Yale example, but they have their organizational structure set up with dyads so that they really are truly working, nurse manager, physician leader, and whatever those other key disciplines might be, physical therapy as an example with an ortho unit and working really on shared performance goals so that we know what we're doing you know, as a whole. Um, a couple of work streams when we think about what is it that we can actually control versus what is outside our control and that's where back to that, what, what are, are those fabulous nurse leaders, those ones who are really getting results they know how to have those difficult conversations and come to a conclusion and resolution. And that becomes the art that I think fits in with, with all of that. Now early on when we were talking about what's, what is one of the biggest um, challenges, it's that issue of being available 24-7, 365. Do you have a, a house supervisor type role or how are things handled for evenings, nights, and weekends when it's not your typical hours? Somebody tell me. Somebody from Med Surge area. They call, they, call you at home. they call you at home. Is there anybody here in house they could call? You know, they call me when there's patients holding in the ER or um, there's a staffing crisis in the middle of the night. This morning at 440, I get a call and text about um, not enough staff. There's, you know, um, so it's 24-7 me. There are and CSLs, but the CSLs are the ones that are calling me. It's the CSL that's calling you. 
is there, uh, maybe I'm not, is there anybody else they would relay that to no. in the structure? Okay, so when you guys are gone, the CSLs run the house. There's an administrator on call, which is what level person? And a director on call. And who would call that director on call, or I would assume a director on call for like nursing would get called before an administrator on call. So would, it, would a CSL call them directly? They can. Thank you, Bill. Dr. Crow. <laughs> Sometimes the CSLs choose to call their director rather than calling the director on call, which kind of diminishes the director on call to maybe a staffing office. So I think there's um, a lot of work we can do around those positions, but then there's also an administrator on call that can handle other types of situations as well. Okay. When you say a director on call, that's one of you all, right? A unit director. And do you cover the whole house or do you cover things within your service line? We also have a patient flow manager who is um, historically a house supervisor, but they're um, strictly to manage patient flow. So I think there has been some, I guess, uh, feelings around the work that they used to do, you know, rather than the work we need them to do right now, which is to manage patient flow and and handle those things in house. So that role has been kind of a contentious. Spot. So it sounds like maybe that's kind of evolved without necessarily putting a deliberate process in place. There have been deliberate processes, but there's been a lot of workarounds. Okay. Okay. Remember when I said early on we can be our own worst enemies and we gotta figure out if we want to fix it or not. Yeah. What's your name? Tracy. Tracy, that's not hi Tracy. I'm glad you've been speaking up. Tell us what's on your mind. <laughs> All I was going to say is what Angie's talking about is for med surge and ICU. Okay, and so women's and peds, which was who brought that up, are not handled that way. So okay. they do call either their director, manager, AVP. And a lot of times it is the CSLs calling um, because they, you know, aren't sure what to do. Got it. Okay. So a, a couple of practices in this area, and I'm asking those questions because it relates to this practice 10 about decision escalation. And, and the choice of, is it working okay, or is it becoming burdensome? And when it gets to the point that it feels burdensome, then that's when you say, no, maybe we look at this a little bit differently. I mean, this is this lovely screen that, you know, it can go off all the time and it becomes very difficult. This business of 24-7 communication, I mean, it just, um, it, it just blows me away when I really think about how it has blown up, if you will. And that sense of we say, you have 24-7 accountability, so does that mean you have to be the one who answers that all the time? Uh, to me, this is like, and, and we've got a program out there on data-driven prescription, but it's, anybody else got to teach a teenager how to drive? You know, you tell them what the white lines are for, those are their boundaries, and they do everything they can within those boundaries, you know, and that's like our, our CSLs, and, and when they get to a situation they don't know what to do outside those, do we have a plan for them? Um, this is an escalation tree, if you will, where we're looking at both the level of urgency. There are some things that we do have to deal with right now, but some that can wait for us to know about until Monday morning if it happened on, on Friday night. When do you, you know, this is Valley Health and them trying to identify, when do you call the clinical administrator, the manager, you know, forgetting whatever your titles are, it would be when does a CSL consult maybe with a more senior CSL or somebody else on their service line before they then call their director who then calls, you know, and do you call the director or is the process such that you call the director on call? Now, there's some unique areas. I mean, I, I had a level one trauma, level one burn. Would, would the med surge person always know what to do with a burn, you know, when we've got a huge fire? No. You got to make some decisions. But here they put together their guidelines for contacting a, a nurse director, in your case, after hours, you know, 
how do you escalate? Staff go to their clinical leaders who then may get to go to who that clinical administrator, whoever that on-call person is. And it, it becomes that question, if, if you've got a director on call, is that working for you? Is it not working for you? If it's not, why is it not? Did you orient one another to all that? Do you trust one another for those calls? Or would you just as soon come to you? You guys, those are really candid, direct discussions to have with one another. And it's important to be able to get to the point of, of doing that. This is part of what Valley Health went through. After all of that discussion, developing what should the guidelines be, then are we as directors compliant with those guidelines? If yes, why? If no, why? I know a, an experience I had was with a director's rotating call, and I had one director in particular that nobody felt she responded in a, a way that was particularly helpful. So do we need to teach people how to respond in those situations? And then what's the authority that one has? And are you an organization that has the, the philosophy of sometimes um, you take authority until you've been told you took it too far? You know, that whole sense of where do I, where do I go with that? So I think we've got to find a way to protect some of our time. You, it, it's hard to do. 24-7, 365, and we know our managers are feeling a lot, of, a lot of that. The other question, and it gets to our last practice, is when do you have any time to think? When do you have any time to just reflect? Um, and I think that became the challenge, and, and you see here sort of thinking about the manager with I got to take care of staffing today. It's 4:40 in the morning. That's a different situation than the organization is looking at starting this new program that's going to impact what I'm doing in my area. How do I need to prepare my staff? I mean, the thought that goes into this. Texas Health developed what they call their manager reflection day. Manager plans a day. Typically, it's about a day a month. And you know what? During that day, you are not expected on hospital grounds. However, before you take that day, you're going to have had a conversation with the, the person, persons that you report to with what is top of mind for you? What do you need a chance to think about, to plan, to work on? And, you know, if I'm paired up with between the ICUs, between med surge, who is my partner? Who is it that my staff will call in lieu of me being available. And you know, Cole doesn't care. If you think and reflect best on the massage table, then go to the massage table. I, I mean, seriously. It's taking that reflection day, planning what's going to be covered, plan for unit coverage, but then when you come back, there's got to be a discussion about what was it that came about. I've had several people in programs that have been a part of this that really talked about how much it did for them just to know that they were going to get a day that was coming up in the future to be able to think about. Um, what interesting thought. What do you think? <laughs> Bill, what do you think about that? You've got the mic there in your hand. Do you have to use PTO? No, no. That's a good question, though. They consider that part of their work time. You got a thumbs up for that question. <laughs> Other thoughts? Yeah, Lynn. Oh, I, was there, I, I didn't see one down here. I'm sorry. So I know sometimes maybe once a month I'll work from home, and it's amazing how much I can get done at home. Yeah. I noticed, back to this sense of, of we can be our own worst enemies, when I changed my personal language from I got to work Saturday, I'm just so far behind, to I choose to go in on Saturday because it's going to make next week much easier and I can get a whole lot done in a short time. It was how I said it even to myself. You know, my goal right now is getting through February because I got a week off in March. You know, it's, so time's coming. Where'd the mic go? Oh, you've still got it. Other thoughts, questions about it? 
Open up to the other campuses. What do they think about it? Good, good point, Tracy. Thank you. What do you guys think about a reflection day? Or do you have plenty of time to think? I don't know. They're just looking. No, they're just looking. <laughs> You know, you know, it's not about just not taking about a day. Taking a day. Oh, thanks, we'll cut back to that. It is about that sense of, you know, you are in roles that are not just doer bees. So to me, this is a good example of where, you know, do, do we feel any freedom to do anything differently in our schedules or do we let ourselves get so locked in that we can't move or doing anything, do anything further. Those of you that have been around um, advisory board presentations know that towards the end of all of them we grade the practices. It's subjective but that first grade is about how big an impact does this have and the second is about how difficult is it to bring about. Um, you can see reorganizing the nurse consultants from education can be a bigger challenge. That reflection block. I mean, it's a, it's a chance to look at uh, predetermined project rounding can have a really, really good impact, but it takes a lot of coordination at the most senior level. So you've got a grading with all of those. I guess go back to that and react to me. Of the practices we've talked about today, what, what rings a bell for you? What's something that you might want to investigate further? How do you enforce those boundaries? How do you enforce those boundaries? Because I have said, you know, don't call me on the weekends, don't call me at night, all of those things, and yet somehow there's still those people that call you on the weekends and call you at night. And even if you don't answer, it's still like, oh my gosh, I just need one minute that somebody doesn't text me. So my thing is, how do you enforce it? Can I ask some questions? When you said, don't call me with that, what was given to them as instructions for what to if do? If it's something that's not an emergency, so besides the fact that we have a therapy coming in and no one to take care of it, um, it's if it's something that you need, email it to me. And then that way on Monday when I come in, I'll look at my email. We've put out a schedule for the CSL so they know which CSL is here what day. Um, I think that's helped a little bit, but still my CSL was off yesterday and somehow she still got a text from someone that's here at the hospital that knows she's not here. So what do you do when people still continue to push those boundaries? What do you guys do? What'd somebody say? Stop responding. But it's still so aggravating. Even when you stop responding, it's like my phone still dings and then it's like I'm thinking about work again. Turn the dinger off. Yeah, but my family calls me too. <laughs> then you use one phone for both. Yeah. Rather, okay, I mean, some organizations will require separate. I, I couldn't handle that many things, but okay. So you got you to have it on. Do you know the name Dr. Don Abedian? Do you know who, who Dr. Don Abedian was? He was a physician, uh, Lebanon who came to the U.S. and he was the one who really started uh, writing and saying, you know, in the 60s when Medicare and Medicaid came about, that we owe it to our patients to really focus on quality. And to do that we have to look at outcomes. And so he's the one who came up with the, with the uh, designated process of structure, process, outcome. And the fact that you have to put structures in place, identify the process steps to get to the outcome. And if you aren't getting that outcome, you got to go back and review the structure and the process. So thinking about yours, it's not quite working like you want it to yet. So the structure of being very explicit. Uh, an emergency to me may be very different than an emergency to you. So give me some examples. This is the th these are the things I want to be notified of. These are the things that I want you to call whoever this person is that's, that's in-house. Make the process such that um, 
Maybe if you get those calls you don't answer, by golly, make sure you circle around with that person, the next person you can, you time you see them, and be able to say, I know you tried to get hold of me on Saturday afternoon, and I, I wanted to let you know a, a, a little bit of background of why I didn't answer that at the time. You know, we've talked about here's who's available, who else did you call, the calls that you should be getting if you're doing that kind of de-escalation should be coming from your peers that are covering for you not yeah there are times um, but you got to specify what those are so I think it it's really about educating people to what the rules are and how you expect them to follow but then you hold people accountable and you don't respond or you follow up with next time this is what I want you to do who's got other suggestions on how to handle it I sent an email out to all of my staff about my expectations of them, what I needed them to do, and what I needed to be alerted on. And that helped because I used to get calls probably, and I work for the health center, and we have three sites. And so I was getting called from all three sites about most of the same things. So for me to send out my expectations of what I needed, it cut down tremendously on the texts and emails I received. And I also put it back on them that if you call me with an issue, I'm going to expect a solution from you. And then we will Here's work on a better Here's what I've done about way. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think one of the things I've really learned as I've done more and more research and work with the different generations, and we've got so many of us in the, the workplace, we leaders need to learn how to be very, very clear in how we state our expectations. Even if you read a lot of our mission statements about providing family-centered care, what, what does that mean? What can I expect from that? Um, you know, I've, I've had managers talk about hiring a new staff nurse, and it's the very first full-time job this person's ever had. One gave me the example of he didn't realize why he needed to come to work on time that people were, as a team, waiting on him to leave as well as get started with the day. I think we have to learn how to be very explicit in what our expectations are in a different way than we've been challenged to do before. And with that goes the whole issue of it's not about how much time you have in a role, but it's about the competencies that we need you to develop and that you, you put together. So, I mean, I think those are the two big conclusions that you know, I've had working with that. These are a couple of managers that, that we encountered in doing our research for this piece. Looking at really impacting patient experience and turnover, and it's about how engaged are they, and are they active and problem solving, and um, I think my hope after today, um, there are probably a lot more things that some of you were thinking about than you were willing to say and share. I hope you will get together in your own groups and do some follow-up of that. What is it that you need to do to make your lives better? Um, because we, we desperately, as we said at the beginning, you've got the most important roles, and we need really good people in our organizations with that. So that concludes what I have formally. I'm glad we've got just a few minutes. Anybody got comments, questions, feedback? Please, here comes the mic. You guys have done better at that than I think I would. You're used to it, thank you. I was actually writing it in my comments, but I don't think staff nurses sometimes realize what all goes along with this. And I think this would be eye-opening to them um, to attend something like this just to see kind of what goes on with us and it's not just us saying these things that this is a problem mm -hmm. everywhere mm -hmm. because I, I feel like sometimes I just don't and it's, it's hard to tell them what I'm doing in a day because the days are so different and mm -hmm. I can't go through and list out everything that I'm doing you know just because some of it's competent you know whatever I'm working right, on. Right. Um, a couple of, of, of thoughts. When I ask you all, 
you know, what was the biggest surprise as you moved into management? The, one of the first things that came up from everybody was the amount of time it took. We don't, until we've walked in somebody's shoes, I don't care what that role is, we don't know what the nurse practitioner role is going to be until we go to school and we practice and whatever. So, f first of all, it becomes, I think, clarifying some of that. As much as we can let people know, there's a, I don't think I have it with me, I have a really good article about perception of nurse managers that was published several years ago that I use a lot for our non-nursing staff at advisory board to try to understand why are they always talking about how convoluted. I'll, I'll send that as well. Um, but I think it is worth some discussion um, in the fact that we have walked in staff nurse shoes. Um, I'd been at the executive level in 20 years into a nursing role, and I left and went back to a staff position, and it was amazing, in a different you know, in hospice and community health, it was an amazing learning. So be sure we're as open to learning from them as we expect them to learn from us. Yeah, very excellent point. Other thoughts? Have they given you a pedometer to wear while you do this with the mics and whatnot? This is unique for me speaking up, but... Um, well, thank you. <laughs> I within a short period of time, within probably the last year, year and a half, I went from staff nurse to CSL to an interim director. And I just want to say kudos to all you directors, because I had no idea how hard it was. And uh, they do an awesome job. So. Thank you. So kudos to all of you directors. And I, I mean, and, and every one of those positions has challenges with it. And that raises the question, what are we doing to better prepare people before they come into that with an idea of what it's going to be? So. You guys, thank you for your time and attention. All of you out there, thank you so much for your time and attention. And I'll be around for a little bit if folks have questions. Do you need to wrap up, Jan? Yes, I do. Before you leave, everybody, before you leave. Well, everybody, before you leave. No, no, it's fine. I want to thank everybody for being here. And if you will, please do something for me. Please keep your hand out because this will be our work guide as we go forward because we'll be doing a lot of work on this, not only with this nursing leadership group, but you'll be doing some work with your staff because, as I've heard, it would be great if our staff were involved in a little bit of this work. So we'll take this and we'll use this as our guide, our roadmap, if you will, to, to do further sessions. So don't do anything with it or put it where you won't be able to find it. We'll have to set some priorities because there were a lot of things. Oh, there's so much in here. It was good. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. It was wonderful. Let's give her a hand, please. It's hard to stand up here that long and just talk. But it was great. I think there were so many points uh, in the session that we can all identify with and know that we need to work on. Okay, a couple of things as you go out. I want you on your left to put your evaluation and on your right, put your form for CEUs. So please don't be the one that comes back and says, I didn't get CEUs. Fill out your form because these will come from the advisory board, not from me or anybody else okay two forms you have to leave on the way out thank you for your attention also pick up food as you go there's bagels and there's waters and they don't need to stay down here so pick it up if not for you for your staff thank you